Hello and welcome back to High Peak Education. I would like to perform a multi-step longer problem that uses the conservation of energy to calculate something that's rotating and something that's moving and this is a little bit more of a basically realistic problem of something that you might experience in the real world. Okay. It turns out devices like this are often used to search for the coefficient of either static or kinetic friction for an object. And by the way, in order to search for that, we often have to have real pulleys. And notice that this real pulley, uh, we're going to assume this real pulley doesn't have any friction. Now, real pulleys have a little bit of friction. This one has none. Even real pulleys that are designed like this have very small friction. So even if you didn't include it, the answer wouldn't be too far off. But these devices are often used to, again, figure out what uh, coefficients of friction exist between objects that rub against one another, say, being dragged across a table. Now in this particular case, we have a figure, uh, but we know the coefficient of friction, but we want to know uh, the speed that this block should go through the second photo gate. Let's assume that we calculated a coefficient of friction. We want to see if our calculation was correct. Maybe it's a verification. And um, we're not going to have any air resistance in this problem, but it turns out that most everything else is not going to be assumed. So this is going to be quite a lengthy problem. So, in the figure, the sliding block has a mass of 0 0.850 kilograms and the counterweight has a mass of 0 0.420 kilograms and the pulley is a hollow cylinder with a mass of 0 0.350 kilograms and an inner radius of 0 0.0200 meters and an outer radius of 0 0.0300 meters. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the horizontal surface is 0 0.250. The pulley turns without friction on its axle. The light cord does not stretch and does not slip on the pulley. The block has a velocity of 0 0.820 meters per second toward the pulley when it passes through the photo gate. A. Use energy methods to predict its speed after it has moved to the second photo gate 0 0.700 meters away B. Find the angular speed of the pulley at the same moment. Okay, so we've got several things to write down here and several things to label. So I'm going to sort of label each of these things uh, carefully and then talk through several concepts before we start writing any sort of conservation energy equation. So let's go one step at a time. We've got this 0 0.850 kilogram counterweight block. Now, by the way, this entire time, um, I want you to assume uh, three significant digits. So when we're calculating here, if I just write that this is the mass of the block, and keep in mind, the block is larger mass than the counterweight. So that's an interesting thing. A lot of people think, at times, that the counterweight needs to be a larger mass than the block on the table. That's not necessarily the case. It depends upon the coefficient of friction. Okay? So the idea is that the mass of the block is actually larger. So let's call this um, MB. That's the mass of the block. So that's 0 0.85 kilograms. Again, knowing that really everything is three significant digits. We also know what the counterweight is. So let's label this as MC. That's the counterweight. So MC, the mass of the counterweight, is 0 0.420 kilograms. Again, three significant digits, but we're sort of abbreviating here. And it's a pulley with a hollow cylinder. Okay, so let's stop there for a second. Hollow cylinder seems to suggest to us that it's a certain rotational inertia shape hollow cylinder. You can go to a rotational inertia table and look that up 
but a hollow cylinder has an inner radius and an outer radius. So the rotational inertia of a hollow cylinder is going to be like one half the mass of the hollow cylinder times the inner radius squared plus the outer radius squared. So uh, capital R1 here is the inner radius, R2 is the outer radius. So in fact what I've got sketched here is again a hollow cylinder, sometimes called an annular ring, where an annular ring has an inner radius and an outer radius, R1 and R2. So I think we actually have all those values. We have inner radius, R1 is 0.02, and the outer radius, that's R2, is 0.03. Again, these are in meters. We know that there are three Neiman digits. I'm just omitting several of the trailing zeros just for brevity in writing this down. And we also know that it has a mass of 0 0.350 kilograms. Okay, so I think we'll probably want to calculate this rotational inertia. So let's go ahead and just calculate this for the hollow cylinder. This is one half mass of the hollow cylinder, that's 0 0.35 kilograms, times inner radius, which is 0 0.02 meters squared plus outer radius, and that's 0 0.03 meters squared. I've moved this over and let's go ahead and calculate this using the calculator. So we have 0.5 times the mass which is 0.35 times the inner radius of 0.02 squared plus the outer radius of 0.03 squared. Close off that parenthesis and enter. So that's 2.275 times 10 to the minus 4. And let's round that to three significant digits, so 2.28. 2.28 times 10 to the minus 4, and that's kilograms times meters squared. Okay, so there's the rotational inertia of the hollow cylinder. Okay, let's keep going, because I think we will need that. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the horizontal surface is 0 0.250. Okay, so let's stop there. So 0 0.250 for the coefficient of kinetic friction means that there is a friction between the block and the table surface. So it's going in this direction, okay? So this is the force of friction kinetic. Force? of friction kinetic. Okay, so there it is. And we know what the mu is associated with that, so let's write that down. Mu k is 0 0.250. Notice it's unitless because that's how coefficients of friction are. Because remember, they're sort of dimensionless fractions or decimals. The pulley turns on its axle without any friction. Okay, so that's just rotating there. We're not going to worry about that. The light cord does not stretch and does not slip on the pulley. Again, we're just going to assume massless cord, the cord does not stretch, so no elasticity change, anything like that. The block has a velocity of 0 0.820 meters per second. Okay, so let's write that down. So this block should have an initial velocity like this. Okay, so let's call this V initial. And then after it passes the second photo gate, it's got a larger velocity. So that's like the V final. Okay. Also notice that the block has a certain velocity that it's moving when it passes the first photo gate, but then we're looking for the final velocity when it passes the second photo gate. So we're saying that uh, V initial is 0 0.82 meters per second. Again, three significant digits really. V final is the question mark. But notice, what's the velocity of the counterweight going to be? Well, that should be the same as the velocity of the block because the counterweight is tied to the block. So I think that initially here, this counterweight has V initial, but it's down. Okay, so those are meant to be the same. But by the time it gets to the ground, 
it should have this v final. And then this should be the same as this final velocity when the block passes the second photo gate. By the way, you may say, wait a second, the counterweight is dropping. You may say the counterweight is dropping and it drops to here. Now we don't necessarily know if that's the floor or not, but you could imagine that in some sense as a floor, only because this is how far we really care about the counterweight descending. So let's look at this distance. So this distance is like a height, but wait a minute, the height should be related to something else. If you look carefully in terms of the string and the figure, that's also the same thing as this delta x. So delta x should be the same thing as the height. So in this problem, and I think this is quite important, we should call this the positive x direction for the block on the table, and then this the positive y direction for the counterweight moving downward. And in fact, when we go on from here, height seems to me to suggest potential energy. So we'll talk about that. But basically, let's go ahead and set this height equal to zero meters, where it reaches this final velocity, because I think this system would accelerate. But again, that's going to be the same final velocity as the block is moving horizontally. Okay, so let's get back to what we were reading. The block has a velocity of 0 0.82 meters per second, we talked about that, towards the pulley when it passes through the photo gate. Use energy methods to predict its speed after it has moved to the second photo gate 0 0.700 meters away. Notice that's going to be the delta x or the h we're talking about. So delta x, which equals h, should equal to, let's see, 0 0.7 meters. Again, it's really three significant digits, but that's 70 centimeters, so 7 tenths of one meter. Okay, and we are told to use energy methods. Now, I'm going to recommend energy methods are easier in this problem. You could solve this problem using Newton's laws. You could also solve it using torque on the pulley, etc., etc. By the way, one more thing I should comment on the pulley. So on the pulley, note that this pulley has a certain velocity on the edge, and this velocity on the edge is the same thing as these linear velocities. So what we can note is we can note the V tangential on the pulley is equal to the linear velocity of the cord, and that's the same as the linear velocity of the block and the counterweight. Okay, so I should just mention that. And by the way, that's gonna also be at R2 for its radius, because notice that R2 is the outer radius of this annular ring. Again, the same thing as the hollow cylinder. All right, so let's finally get now into our energy methods. So let's think carefully about all of our terms for conservation of energy here. So notice that when the block passes this photo gate, it has kinetic energy but so does the annular ring, that's the hollow cylinder, and so does the counterweight. So that's three kinetic energies, so we need to write those down. So we need the kinetic energy of the block, and then we need the kinetic energy of the counterweight, and then we need the rotational kinetic energy of the hollow cylinder. Okay, so those kinetic energies are all at play. Next, we need to think about what about the counterweight? Well, the counterweight is gonna drive the system in the sense of it's releasing potential energy as it descends. So I think that there's a gravitational potential energy initially of the counterweight. And by the way, each of these kinetic energies are um, initial, so I'll put subscripts of I on them. And I think there's one other kind of energy or one other kind of energy transfer at play. Okay, hopefully you paused the video and thought about it. I think friction is doing work. In other words, it's doing negative work. So let's write that as minus the work 
by the force of friction kinetic, and this is non-conservative. That's when we do NC, and I think those are all the kinds of energy that are at play, at least initially and interacting in terms of transferring energy. Now, what about when the block reaches the second photo gate? Well, the block and the pulley and the counterweight are all still moving, so they all have their kinetic energy final. So let's write those down. So kinetic energy of the block final plus kinetic energy of the counterweight final plus the rotational kinetic energy of the hollow cylinder final and I'm just about out of room but notice that I think we should be good because when this counterweight drops it comes to zero potential energy as we've defined it and the friction has already done its due diligence in terms of acting on this block in terms of taking energy away okay so there we go this is our conservation of energy equation. So now that we have our conservation of energy equation, on the next board, I will show how to fill in these terms more specifically, and we'll also try to uh, start solving for this final velocity. Now, by the way, one more thing. Uh, we should talk about this work done by friction, and we should also talk about this rotational kinetic energy. So let's first talk about the work done by friction before we go to the next board. So the work done by friction, let's have a think about this. So we know work done by force of friction should be something like force times displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. But it turns out this minus sign already takes into account the cosine of the angle between them. It's cosine of 180 degrees, which is negative one. So that's why we have the minus sign here. So we don't want to be redundant. So it's force of friction, kinetic, times the displacement, that's delta x, okay? Remember this delta x is the same as this delta x. Notice the force of friction kinetic, it's on a flat surface. So that should be the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. That's mu k times the mass of the block times g times this delta x. So mu k times mass of the block g times delta x. So we'll use that on the next board. Okay. Then we should also talk about the pulley and the rotational kinetic energy of this uh, spinning pulley. So for this pulley, let's think about yet again how this tangential velocity uh, is related to the linear velocity here. Well, the tangential velocity is going to be like the angular velocity times the radius. So that's V equals omega times R2. Now notice, I think this rotational kinetic energy term is going to have a omega in it. So wherever we see omega, we should be able to put uh, V over R. 2. Now notice, by the way, um, V is either V initial over here, or it's going to be V final. Okay, so we're out of space. Let's go ahead and on to the next board, and let's see how we can get these terms in terms of our conservation of energy equation. So welcome back. Here I've recopied the conservation of energy equation on the top line, and what I'd like to do is start filling in these terms. So. The kinetic energy of the block should be one half mass of the block times the initial velocity of the block squared plus the kinetic energy of the counterweight is one half the mass of the counterweight, the initial velocity squared. Remember, these have the same initial velocity plus the rotational kinetic energy of the hollow cylinder, one half I of the hollow cylinder, omega initial squared, plus the initial gravitational potential energy of the counterweight, that's mgh initial, or just h, we're just calling it, minus the work non-conservative done by friction, that's gonna be 
mu k m block g times delta x okay equals and then we need these kinetic energies just as over here except all with the subscript f for final all right so everything is now filled in now let's perform our plan of attack first of all most terms in this equation have a one half in them so let's first um, just kind of note our steps here so our steps are going to be uh, steps are going to be one multiply by two if you multiply by two all these one halves go away now these two terms get a factor of two out front of them but that'll be easier to deal with so that's the first step the second step is remember omega should equal v over r2 and remember if we can do initial here or we could do final over here so again omega final is v final over r2 all right so i'm going to use the method of i've mentioned this before collect and then factor and then solve so collect means collect all the v final terms to one side we effectively have already done that when we replace v final over r2 for this omega final okay so that's effectively done then we need to factor so we'll factor that on the next line and then solve in this case for v final okay so we're gonna and by the way when we factor here we factor out v final squared okay so let's do this we're gonna multiply this whole equation by two so we've got m b v i squared plus m c v i squared plus and then we know what the rotational inertia of the hollow cylinder is but then this becomes the initial squared over r2 squared and then plus now there's a factor of 2 2 m g h minus 2 mu k g or sorry mu k m b g delta x equals m b v final squared plus m c v final squared plus i and this is v final squared over r2 squared okay so there we go now this v final squared needs to get factored out and then we've got let's see m b plus m c plus this will be i over r2 squared now the left hand side here stays exactly the same so we need to divide by what's in parentheses here that is the left hand side and then take the square root to get v final okay so i will use some clever copying and pasting so i copied the left hand side i copy what's in parentheses on the right hand side we need to divide them and then we introduce the square root this might be the largest square root you've ever seen in your life and that is equal to v final okay so we'll need to put the values in i'll do that on the next board and welcome back and notice that i've reprinted the final velocity expression that we had before up here on the top and i've inserted all the values now this is quite a calculation but let me mention a couple things First of all, on the previous board, I had a small error, and that small error is that I did not have a squared on this initial velocity term with respect to the kinetic energy term. So uh, this um, needed a squared on it. It had a squared here, but it had lost a squared here in the copying. So notice that this should be the initial velocity uh, squared. Also, one thing that was missing is we had said that the potential energy term was UGI of the counterweight. I forgot the subscript C here on this MGH term. It's MCGH. This is 2MGCH, 2MCGH, and then finally again on the next board, it's, uh, yeah, 
2MCGH, okay? Notice that the mass of the block is 0.85 kilograms. Some places I don't have the units, but other places I do where there's enough room, okay? The counterweight is 0.42 kilograms, so it's put here in its kinetic energy term and in this term right here, okay? And then, sorry, this should be point. So 0.82 is the initial velocity in meters per second, there, there, and then there for these initial kinetic energy terms, okay? Those all end up being squared. Remember, R2, the outer radius of the annular Lure ring that is the hollow cylinder is 0 0.03 meters so that goes in here notice g of course is 9.8 meters per second squared near the surface of the earth delta x is 0 0.7 and the height is 0 0.7 that's meters here's the mu k and i think all the rest of the terms are there oh except for this i so this i i didn't have space to write it in here for the counterweight oh this is I of the hollow cylinder. And so this I is the I of the hollow cylinder. I had space to put it in here. That's 2.28 times 10 to the minus 4 kilogram meters squared. But I did not have space to put it in here. Okay? So, but this I and this I are the same thing. So, you should run this through your calculator. So now I have the calculator out. So we have our calculation put in here, 0.85 times 0.82 squared plus 0.42 times 0.82 squared plus 2.28 times 10 to the, let's see, minus four times, let me move this over. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so 0.82 over 0.03 squared plus 2 times 0.42 times 9.8 times 0.7, that's this term right here, and then minus 2 times 0.25 times 0.85 times 9.8 uh, times 0.7. Okay, so that's the friction term, and then we divide by the sum of our two masses, that's the block and the counterweight, and then again, the rotational inertia of the hollow cylinder divided by the outer radius R2 and square that. Okay, so let's hit enter here in an epic moment. Okay, so we've got about 1.75, and that's gonna be meters per second. Let's write this down. So this should be the final velocity, and this answers part A. And the final velocity, remember, is the final velocity for the block as it moves through the second photo gate, the counterweight as it descends, and the final tangential velocity of the hollow cylinder. Now that takes care of part A. Part B, because we've laid all this out, it's actually pretty straightforward. Recall that if we want the final angular velocity, that's the same thing as the final linear velocity divided by R2. So we can just put that in as 1.75 meters per second divided by R2, and that we know to be 0 0.03 meters. So let's get this value. So 1.75 divided by 0.03 and we've got about 58.3 or so. Again, these are all three significant digits, even though for space consideration, we didn't put all those in here. So 58.3, and that's gonna be radians per second. So let's briefly review what we did here, because this is quite a long problem. It's hard to see the forest for the trees. We had this figure, we marked it up, we started looking at our knowns. We have a sliding block, that's this mass, we wrote that down. We have a counterweight, we wrote that down. We have a hollow cylinder, this is its rotational inertia formula, inner radius, outer radius, R1 and R2. We said this block should move between these two 
photo gates, that's delta x, that's the same distance as h that this counterweight block descends. We said the initial velocity moving through the first photo gate should be the same as the velocity the counterweight is dropping, the same as the tangential velocity of the hollow cylinder, and then when this block reaches the second photo gate, the final velocity again will be the same as the counterweight's dropping velocity and the tangential velocity of the hollow cylinder. We wrote down the radii of the hollow cylinder and its mass. We calculated what that is going to be. We definitely used that value. We wrote down the coefficient of kinetic friction. That's between the block and the table surface. We know that the initial velocity was given, 0.82 meters per second. The final velocity we sought, we said that the tangential velocity is uh, equal to the angular velocity times the outer radius of this hollow cylinder. Okay, So we could replace the angular velocity with tangential velocity divided by R2 whenever we wanted to. We define the positive x direction to the right for the block. Positive y direction is down for this uh, for this descending mass. okay, We assumed three significant digits, even though we wrote things down in a more compact way. We wrote down the conservation of energy, the kinetic energy of the block, the cylinder, the hollow cylinder. Sorry. We wrote down the conservation of energy equation for the block, the counterweight, the hollow cylinder, the potential energy of the counterweight, and that friction did non-conservative negative work, which we talked about, and then each of those three objects we just discussed has a kinetic energy final. We went on from there, we went on from there to write down the conservation of energy equation, write out all the terms. We said that we should multiply by two to get rid of the one halves, replace the angular velocity terms with linear velocity over outer radius, initial and final. We collected the v final squared terms to one side, they're already there. We factored out this v final squared, we solved for v final. So we inserted, we factored out this v final squared, we had all these masses and rotational inertia and radius, we divided, took the square root, we put in the values, here we got the final velocity and once we had the final velocity we divided by the outer radius to get the final angular velocity and that's it hopefully you understand how this problem works by the way if you understand how this problem works i would say you pretty much understand a first semester of calculus-based physics so congratulations you pretty much understand kinematics you pretty much understand forces and energy, you understand uh, rotation, and you understand how they're linked together in one single problem. So congratulations to you if you understand this problem. So thank you for watching High Peak Education, and thank you for staying with me to the end. Please smash that like button if you enjoy this content. Please share this video amongst your social networks, and please subscribe to grow the channel. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.